Hi folks, welcome back. This is our second and last video of the cockpit preparation. You just finished watching the pilot flying complete the FMS. The pilot monitoring came back from his external walk around and he's going to get his nav charts done and he's going to check the FMS preparation followed by doing the glare shield with the pilot flying at the same time, you're going to notice the FCU is a pilot flying task. The oxygen mask, I'm going to put a video that I found on YouTube because FS Labs does not allow me to do it per FCOM. And we're going to go down to the instrument panel and finishing with the takeoff brief. So we're back here in the plane. Pilot monitoring got his charts ready. And he's going to now verify the FMS preparation done by the pilot flying. And a good way to do this is follow the diff's rip again. So we're going to start with data. We're going to go to aircraft status. So database validity is good. Engine type matches our performance paperwork and also our dispatch release. Um, we're going to check here. The idle and perf codes, remember this is a maintenance um, task to change that, so don't ever do it. Um, but the code is usually ARM, ARM, depending on your airline, but the default is ARM. We're going to go over to init. Checking the uh, from to. That matches our paperwork. Boston's our alternate. Uh, flight number is correct. Costing is 25, flight level, temperature, temperature outside, our triple pause. So then we're done with init A. And just a little quick note, this is called init A. If you want to go to init B, you have to push the right arrow. So we're done with I, flight plan. Uh, what you need to do here is put it in plan on the EFIS control panel. Put a decent range and also if you want to see distances make sure constraint is not pushed and i'll show you what that means so i'll make sure constraint is on and you're going to see the difference between constraint on and off uh, we're going to check the if the lateral revision was done correctly a uh, quick way to see it is the departure is click on one lima here departure so on this screen you can check you know the runway the SID was done correctly, no transition, and we're going to check it point by point. And as I move here, as I push up, remember for the French, up is going to go down. So there it is, I got Guano, this continuity makes sense. Pimon, Biap, right turn, and look, because I have constraint on the EFIS control panel, I don't get distances in tracks, but the distance in track is up here as well. But look what happens when I turn it off. Now, as I move along, now down here, you can see the track and the distance. And then with your paperwork, you can check one by one. Uh, J. Ross, Florence, Tubas, and if you want to see two waypoints at the same time, all you have to do is zoom out. Flat Rock, Shona, and now if you look here, you got J51, J51, Flat Rock, and at Flat Rock, we're going to join the Philbo 3 arrival. So here's a good idea to come on and turn the constraints on to make sure. It, the flight levels and altitudes are inserted for your descent. So, Fuber here has a flight level 270. And then Steffi 13 and above. Somto 11, Dylan 8, Metro. And then after Philbo, if you look here, you got a manual. Do not delete that because you're going to be vectored. So constraints are, or discontinuities are okay to be there. Don't think you have to take them all off. And 
And notice what happens when I zoom out too much, the waypoints disappear. So look what happens when I zoom in more, they start to appear. All right, so after Philbo, we're going to be radar vectored, you know, probably on the east side or maybe back on the west side, or the controller might even take you off Dylan here and vector you into four left. Now we're going to check our missed approach. All right, we're going missed off Newark, four left. And then there's another discontinuity because you're probably going to be vectored to Alling. And then all the altitude restrictions on the, on the star into Boston. All right, I also want to verify a vertical revision here. So just pick a point on the right. I want to check wind data. This is your climb winds. Remember, in real life, this is all done via acres for, you know, the majority of the airlines. You're not probably going to be typing one by one. You're going to go to next phase, which should be cruise. And we want to make sure our winds are inserted in there. This is an FS Labs issue. Oh, there it is. 280. And then just a small reminder. Small blue is FMS generated or McDo generator or flight management generated. It's generated by the computer. If you see the blue here is a little bit larger, that means I changed an input. So let's look what happens when I make a change here to the 300 at 120 knots. I'm going to type, uh, let's say 250 at 130 knots and it should go large and it did. Moving along, our winds make sense. We're going to go to our descent winds and then you would insert it in there. This button right here, wind request, is your acres request. And a way to do that if you had acres would be, let's say I want slices starting at 380. You put zero slash zero in the altitude that you want from acres. I'll say I want another slice at 280. Uh, I want another slice of the atmosphere at 180. And let's put something between there. Let's say I want something at uh, 300. And this is what you would do. Zero slash zero and the altitude you want. And once you submit the acres, it's going to fetch what you put as far as the flight level. So it's not that the wind is calm. It's just you're tricking the computer to put the flight level in there and it should come back if you did have acres. So my flight plan is checked. So diff strip, data is done. Init A is done. Flight plan lateral revision was checked and also vertical revisions were also done. So we're off to secondary. On the secondary, click here on the white and we're gonna see what the pilot flying did in case of an engine failure. So it seems like we're taking off three five right and going straight out and then guano from guano oh we're going to tampa so this seems like a alternate takeoff alternate so we're take off of orlando the visibility is not good enough to come back so tampa is our takeoff alternate uh, just a quick review let's say the weather improved and the pilot fly and say hey can you build a return for me? So what we're going to do is copy the active. So everything that was on flight plan now is also copied in the secondary flight plan. And I want to say after takeoff, and instead of Guano, I want to go to Warms. So I'm going to type in Warms. You can put it here. After Warms, I want to go to Oviedo. And you should see the white line now linked to Oviedo. And after Oviedo, I want to go to, let's say, Sabot and do a hold at Sabot.
And then at say bot, I want to change destination. So I click say bot and see where it says new destination. I'll put Orlando. And this invalid up link was because there's no acres here. I'm going to go to Orlando and I'm going to put an arrival and I can choose the longest runway. So just by looking here, I can see the runway lengths. So since we're landing north, I'll find the longest runway. Seems like three six right is a good option. Pretty long runway. So I'm gonna tell, I wanna come back to this runway and approach via, let's see where Tramp is. Yeah, Tramp makes sense. And notice, why is there not a confirm? Well, because see the white, that's secondary. There's no confirmation on the secondary. Now, let me look at the secondary again. So there's a takeoff. We're going to Worms, Oviedo, Sabot. And let's say I need a hold at Sabot to get uh, the plane set up. So I'm going to click Sabot, hold. And let's say I want the plane pointing south during the hold. So the inbound course would be 180. I'll make a left turn so that I don't interfere with final. And I'll ask the controller for three minute legs so I can get the plane ready. So that's inserted. You can come back and check to make sure there's a little turning arrow. There's Sabot with the left hold and my little arrow showing a left turn. Now, click again in secondary and we're going to get the environmentals. So we're going to skip takeoff, we're going to skip climb, we're going to skip cruise, and we're going to get the environmentals ready to go. In case we do come back, everything will be ready for our approach. So the altimeter will probably be the same as it is right now, 3005, 35 degrees Celsius. We'll put the current winds, let's say, actually, winds are out of the north today, 350 and we're going to go comp full and MDA. We're going to get the chart. Let's say I find the chart online. It gives me a minimum of 368. So that is. And if I go missed, company policy says uh, 1,000 feet AGL. So we look at the threshold altitude and let's say 1,000 above is 1090. So I'm going to reduce and accelerate at 1,000 AGL. But if I do have a single engine scenario, I'll wait a little bit longer to 1590. So secondary is completed. So again, diff strip, data, init A, fly plan, secondary, rip is radio navs. So I'll click on radio navs. And I want to have Orlando coming back. I'll put the radio I want. And remember, each pilot gets their own... McDo. So the pilot on the left, let's say he wants to have Orlando 355. And the pilot on the right, let's say they want uh, Ormond B or Lakeland BOR for some reason. This is an example, Radio 90. So up here in the EFIS control panel, I can select what I want either ADF, off. Or VOR1, and this would control VOR2. So I'm done with uh, radio navs, and just a quick note the FMGC or the McDo auto tunes the course, front course, and the ILS frequency for the runway you're taking off. Now, let's say you do activate the secondary. Once you're in the air with an engine failure, it will automatically put the runway you have on the secondary. You'll put the frequency, it will auto tune it for you. So, we're done with radio navs. Let's go init B. So, under init B, I want to check the taxi fuel, so 500 pounds, and that's going to be in your paperwork. We're going to compare the trip time and trip fuel and trip time. Against the paperwork, no route reserve. It's a domestic flight in the US. Our alternate, 36 minutes 
3,200 pounds. Our final is 45 minutes, and there's not a whole lot of extra. So if you get to Newark and you go missed, you're going to have to make a choice. Do I go to my alternate Boston, or do I sacrifice Boston and keep trying Newark? We're going to compare the takeoff weight, make sure we're not exceeding any maximum takeoff or any obstacle restrictions that we have on our climb. And the landing weight is below the maximum allowed structural weight or rowing really limited weight. 6.2 is our minimum fuel to get over Newark and say, okay, let's say I have 6.5 when I'm at Newark. That means you got 300 extra pounds. So this is a good, like a bingo fuel to go to Boston. Uh, trip wind is dashes because I inserted all the winds on the vertical revision. This is my predicted zero fuel, predictive, or actually this is probably our final now. During the walk around, we got the final numbers. And block is 18.9, so what I'm going to do is check this to make sure it matches. So I go to fuel, and I'm checking to see if the tips are full. All right, the center here is empty. Pretty well balanced. And I'll just take a quick look of the overhead, make sure our pumps are on. And our pumps are on. And remember, they go on even though you're fueling, unless your plane is affected by an OEB. So we're done with any B. Perf is the last one. So I have runway 3-5 left. The takeoff shift is if I have an intersection departure, which I don't. We got flap one, flex 50, 146, 146, 153. Now, this is a good time for you to take a look on your PFD. 146, this blue number is your V1, 153 is your V2, and they're both there. You can't see rotation. Transitioning the US is 18, trust reduction 1090 per company policy. That looks right. You can take a look at your climb out, your cruise. You can take a look at the scent. And this is kind of early to fill out, you know, ILS 4 left into Newark. You wait till you're in flight to check it. And we're done. So the pilot monitoring checked everything. So now it's time for the glare shield check. So for the glare shield check, both pilots are sitting down and they are gonna accomplish this together. So first thing we're gonna do is check the barometric reference. And it's kind of like a flow that goes like this. This is the pilot monitoring. So he owns up to here and the pilot flying owns the FCU. So we're gonna accomplish this together. So first off, is the borrow reference. So we can see on the left, we got 3005 and the pilot monitoring here didn't set his up. So this is time to do it. So we both have 3005 and what we're also gonna be looking at later on is to make sure both altimeters match. You can also check the ISIS and there are very, very strict limitations of how many feet they can be off. So we're done with bar reference flight directors. We're gonna make sure they're turned on. They are. And when we look at our EFD, we see one FD2, one FD2. And that's what we do wanna see. Moving on, LS and ILS key. Um, these usually don't go on for takeoff. Now, if I have a low visibility takeoff, I might turn mine on uh, in case in the middle of takeoff roll, you go into a cloud, um, you can probably keep the plane on center line with your feet where you can reject the takeoff. ND mode and range. Um, so ND mode and range. What you wanna do is you wanna have your first waypoint. So let's say we have a takeoff and an immediate turn 180 degrees. That would be a good idea to put under rows nav so you can see the back and also the front. If you're taking off in this case where you're going straight out and your SID is towards the north, I can leave it in arc. 
it's pretty rare for you to have VOR or LS for the partridge. So I'll leave mine in arc. And I want a range where I can see guano. So I got 40 miles. I'll probably be able to see guano here. You don't want to have this range too short where you hide the weather or you can't even see your first waypoint. The VOR and ADF selectors. So I'm going to choose to have both mine on VOR. So I got one VOR here. And one VOR there, and I can see my needles already swung, and it's pointing to this one. Uh, very interesting to note here, which arrow is which. So you see the double arrow versus the single arrow. So just by looking at here, I see a single arrow, so I know it's related to Orlando VOR. If I had seen a double arrow, that would have been VOR number two. And if you see the M right here, this was manually inputted and it hasn't, um, it's not in range. So for example, here it's auto tune with Orlando. Here we got 16 zero and it's not tuned yet or too low to the ground. Now FCU, remember FCU is a pilot flying. He's gonna come up here. What you can take a look at, we got dots and, or actually dashes and a dot. So that means our V2 is inserted. We got a heading, dashes and a dot. So that means it's nav. Now on takeoff, we're going to see that the controller is going to say, hey, fly heading, blah, blah, blah. So you have to come here and put a heading after the departure. So it's probably going to be, hey, turn right, heading 030. Clear for takeoff, so you can leave 030 ready. And guess what happens? Okay, this is interesting. And this happens in real life a lot. So what's wrong with our EFD? We have a green mode. You're not supposed to have green modes on the ground. So the lazy man's way to reset it is just wait for the engine start. When there's a generator change, that heading will disappear and it will reset, or you can reset the flight directors. So let's do the right way. We're gonna turn the flight directors off and we're gonna put them back on. And guess what? It reverted to nav, blue, which is you do, you do wanna see. You don't wanna see any greens on the ground. So I'll leave that in nav for now until I do have a clearance to make this into a heading. You want to make sure the bird is off. So you do want to see heading and vertical speed. Uh, let's say the last crew shot a visual approach and they left it in track FBA. You're going to see track lat. We don't want to see that. So make sure the bird is off. And it is. Oh, and then you can say, well, what happened? My dot disappeared. Go ahead and push it back in. And there's your dot back. And you can look at your PFD and there's your nav blue. Altitude, very important. So we're going to set here to 5,000. That's our top altitude. And then you look at your clearance or, you know, your PDC and then put the top altitude you want there. And again, we have a little dot and we have climb in blue. Now, you don't have to say, hey, dash, 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 dot, dash, dot. You know, we're not a Morse code reader. Just make a mental note. Okay, this does make sense. I have 5,000 and I have dashes on my vertical speed. So my FCU is set. And here's where I'm gonna insert the video for the oxygen mask test. I'll just show you what the setup would uh, be in real life. So first you warn the mechanic, you know, because if they're listening to it, it's going to hurt their ears. So you tell them, hey, maintenance, I'm going to check my mask, you know, remove your headset. So I'm going to turn my intercom volume up. I'm going to move my intercom to INT and it's going to stay there. I'm going to come over to my mask and here's where I'm going to insert the video.
of the trench oxygen check. All right, so one of the quirks with the Airbus, the ND and PFD. So we're gonna adjust the brightness on the PFD. That looks good. I'm gonna make sure my screens are not transferred. Um, for example, if the mechanic turned the ND first and then the PFD, these screens can go you know, backwards on you. So make sure you flip them back. You wanna have the PFD on the left. ND, uh, look what Airbus did. They put two brightness in the same knob. So one brightness is for the weather radar and the other one is for the screen. So just look what happens. So the inner one is the brightness for the ND. Okay, that's fine. But look, the outer brightness is for the weather radar. So let's say you adjust the brightness for the ND and you forgot the weather down low. You're gonna take off. And if the other pilot did the same thing, you might fly in the weather that you didn't see, especially at night. So make sure I always keep the full brightness for the weather radar. And then I can adjust the ND brightness. So now the other pilot is going to do the same thing. So we're going to move over to his side. And he'll do the same thing. He would adjust his PFD brightness, make sure the screens are not backwards and if I was him I would put all full brightness for the weather radar and then adjust his ND brightness and if you look at all these screens they have these photo I think they're called photoelectric sensors down here at the bottom for example if you shine a flashlight in there simulating you know the sun is full bright the screens are gonna brighten up on you if you remove your fingers and it's nighttime they're going to dim, but you can always override them uh, with the switches here on the right. Foot warmer. I've never flown a plane. Well, actually, I have flown a plane that has it. Um, never turned it on. I heard it's not that strong. So PFD is done. And the brightness uh, are done. So now we're actually going to check what's on the PFD. So we want to make sure our top altitude matches, 1FD2, I have climb, nav blue, no green modes on top, my airspeed is zero, I got my V1 146, V2 153, I got blue over brown, plane is leveled, no bank, vertical speed is zero, and this is very important, make sure your altitude is matching within 75 feet of the airport elevation. Obviously, some airports are massive. Make sure, you know, on takeoff, it's matching the threshold elevation. And you're also gonna check the other pilot and make sure they match. I think it's like 20 feet, depending on the altitude you're at. My altimeter setting 3005. My heading makes sense. And if you're a super pilot and you wanna pull the compass out, I never do this. You wanna check to make sure your heading matches or 219 so you can come back down here and we got 219 also on my PFD yeah all right so my PFD is checked we're gonna go over to the ND uh, some people call this the check right corner this can kill you it has killed a crew in the UPS I think it was an A300 they have the wrong two-way point so make sure you always have the correct two-way point. Where are you going next? And here we have an altitude, and then this is going to become guano. TAS is a bunch of dashes. My ground speed is zero. Uh, you might see this ground speed like three, four, or five knots if you've been sitting at the gate after a flight and your IRSs are drifting on you. Uh, the winds are a bunch of dashes, my heading matches my compass, it matches over here, it matches that of the other pilot. I have my VORs, and this is super important. I am on GPS primary right now. So we're done with PFD, we're done with ND, we're going to keep moving left. And this is the job of the pilot flying. He's going to check the landing elevation. So where's landing elevation? Now, if you 
the page door oxy is the standard for this phase of flight. So you're going to have to push pressurization and landing elevation is auto. Zero feet, Boston, sounds right. What you do not want to see is this, and I'm going to move over up here to the overhead. Let's say someone touched this knob right here and took it off the detent in auto. Let's see what happens down here at the, oh, you do not want to see manual unless you're dispatched on the MEL. So you go here and say, oh, that's wrong. Go in the overhead and fix it, put it in auto, and auto is going to look at the FMS and see where you're going. So that's done as well. So for status, if you don't have a white status showing on the EWD, you do not have to push status. So because I have a white status here, I do have to push it. I'm going to go back and push status and let's see what's going on. It's telling me ADR3 is an op. So remember, if the status is not showing here, don't have to push status. If status white is showing, then you have to push status. So we're going to go back and realign that nav ADR3, and it's going to take a few minutes to do it. So we're done with uh, status, and now we're going to perform the takeoff briefing. For the takeoff briefing, uh, the FCTM Flight Crew Techniques Manual has this available to pilots as a guide. Some airlines actually print this, and the pilots uh, will pull it out and read it. Um, my opinion is since you're going to be doing this hundreds, if not thousands of times, you might as well memorize it. So it follows a order, and Airbus makes a point that briefing is brief. You know, you're supposed to be concise and relevant. So first step, we're going to go over miscellaneous, and I'll show you what that is. And then moving along, we're going to go to init B page, and you see how the arrow goes. They want you to review in that order, followed by the takeoff performance page, starting with the runway. Going up, V speeds, engine out acceleration, and that ties into flight plan and abnormal operations. Uh, moving over to the next page, this is what the miscellaneous are. Um, so we're going to go over aircraft type and model. It doesn't say engine type because you already verified that. Status of that aircraft, uh, what OEBs you read it together, notums, weather. The runway is wet, dry, contaminated, compact with ice. Uh, if you're going to do a engine any ice takeoff, or if you're going to need wing any ice, you know, as soon as you retract the flaps. If you're going to go single engine or twin engine on the taxi out, which way you're going to push back. Um, this is not a good idea to do because, you know, the FAA says you should never, you know, guess what taxi instructions you're going to get because that creates an expectation bias. Now, if you're flying at an airport that only has one taxiway leading to the runway, you know, by all means, but you shouldn't guess what you're going to get because you might uh, form a mental image and then do that instead of waiting for your clearance. Use a radar if it's going to be on or off uh, and if it's going to be PAX on for takeoff. Um, Airbus, a lot of operators have gone the Airbus way and every takeoff is a PAX off takeoff. So this covers the miscellaneous. Two is in it B page and you're going to start seeing things with ones. Anytime you see a one, it means it requires a cross check. So block fuel, we're going to say 19,000 pounds, but where do you look at? You look on the fuel on board on the EWB page. Um, Takeoff performance. We're going to review the runway and then once it gets to flex and toga, well, we're going to have to go flex and toga and MCDU and make sure it matches. You want to be RV2? You're looking at the McDo, but why are you cross checking on the PFD? And we're moving over to flight plan. We're going to talk about MSA. There's another one. So you're going to check on the EFD and make sure your target altitude is correct. 
radio navs and then abnormal. Um, captain will be the one deciding if it's a stop or a go. And we're going to talk about what to do in case of a engine failure. So let's get this done. All right, so we're ready for our briefing. Uh, miscellaneous, the first thing is aircraft type and model. So we have the A320-200. So for tail strike awareness, you know, about 11.7 degrees or so. Anything above 10 realistically. Uh, so just make sure if it's a 320, 321, rotate slow. Aircraft technical status, so there's no MELs, no CDLs, and we check the OEBs together, especially OEB 48, and we know what actions to take. We verified our NOTAMs here at the departure, uh, also our destination and route, and also our alternate of Boston. Runway conditions, so runway 35 left is dry, and also the taxiways are dry. Um, this will be an engine and the ice off, wing and the ice off. Engine start, we're going to do a single engine taxi out. So we're going to start number one. And closer to the runway, we'll start number two. Push back. So we're air side three. So we'll be going tail towards the northwest. And we're not going to guess where we're going to come out. That's going to depend on what the controller says. He might say Echo 3, Echo 2, Echo 1. So that's the reason we don't try to guess the taxi instructions. Uh, we do know we're going to 3, 5 left. And once we get there, we're going to turn the radar on and turn the packs off for takeoff. So now that we're done with miscellaneous, we'll go and go to init B. We'll push init and then right arrow. So what we want to check here is our block fuel, AT9, and you want to make sure you got AT9 on your tanks. And what do we got now? We only have 16.5 because we've been doing this video for too long. So we're going to stop our briefing and get some fuel. And remember, this is just a FS Labs feature here and I'm just gonna fill it up again. But uh eighteen nine. Alright, so our fuel on board is back to what we need. Eighteen nine and that matches our init B. Eighteen nine you could update it to nineteen if you wanted to. Estimated takeoff weight will be one forty eight point nine er Make sure that's below maximum takeoff weight and also below any limitations we have for climb out, obstacles, brake energy. So we're all below that. And our extra time is only three minutes, about uh, 300 pounds only. So we're done with the Nate B. Next thing, we go over to performance. And we start up here in the corner. We're only three, five left. Takeoff config be flaps one. Our flex will be 50. And later on, we're going to be able to see 50 up here as well as the engines are on. Our V1, 146. VR, 146, 153. And we're going to cross check that and make sure those numbers are also showing on our PFD. And they are. We got V1 146 and V2 153. So they match. Our transition altitude, we're in the US, so that's pretty easy. It will be 18. Got 18,000 feet transition. We're going to reduce and accelerate 1,000 AGL, so about 1,090 reduction, 1,009 acceleration. And we do not brief this yet. That's going to be uh, later on. So we're done with step three, and step four will be flight plan. So for our flight plan, we're going to make sure we have our charts out. So for our flight plan, we have up here the McCoy to departure, top altitude of five, which matches our EDC. We're probably going to be taking off 3, 5 left, 3, 5 right. 
it says climb on heading is assigned. We're going to cross 2 DME south of Orlando VOR or above 2300. So I did draw this on fixed info. Cross Orlando Vortec, radio 115 above 26. And cross the Orlando 090 above 3. So all of these I have on my fixed info. Notice the government charts don't have MSA. So all I did here, I got the RNAV 36 left or 36 right for our return. Uh, 3,000 feet, around 25 miles, run with 36 left. So we know we got plenty going above three. And there's not a whole lot of obstacles here in the central Florida that go too high. And there's uh, no terrain as well. So with that information, we go up here, make sure that's all set up. So right here on our FCU. We have our top altitude of 5, and that matches our clearance and our SID. Our flight plan description, we have to make sure we do have Guano. So we did insert the McCoy 2. We have the correct runway. We have manual for vectors, and let's see if Guano shows up. And then we've got Guano, so all that matches our chart. If you want to check the distances as well, but you should have already done that. Got a mile, 18, 23, and really the FMS doesn't know how far we're going to go on that heading before you get vectors to Guano. And radio navs, uh, VOR2, we have Lakeland radio 090. Second one, we got Orlando 055. If we want to make any changes, I want to say, okay, I want Orlando on VOR2 as well. And I want radio zero, or actually radio 115 drawn. Okay, so radio navs is re are ready too. So we're done with number four. So now we're moving on to number five, which is abnormal operations. So briefings vary from airline to airline, captain to captain. Um, they can say something like this, you know, it will be my decision to reject prior to V1, which is 146. If I do reject, I'll bring the aircraft to a stop. I'll put the parking brake on and let the flight attendants know we rejected the takeoff by saying maybe flight attendant at stations. And FO, are you going to let the tower know we rejected the takeoff? Uh, request emergency equipment if needed. And we'll both do the ECAM actions and or emergency evacuation checklist. After V1, we're going to make the decision to go. No actions will be taken up to 400 feet, uh, except putting the landing gear up. After 400 feet, we can do the ECAM action related to, it'd be engine fail, engine fire. And once the engine reached uh, secure, which could be three different scenarios, we don't have to brief it now. So let's say we have engine secure. We're going to stop the ECAM, push the level aloft, accelerate the aircraft, clean up closer to the green dot. We're going to go open climb, cycle the thrust levers to MCT, and climb out until, let's say, 3000, which is our MSA. Our plan is to activate the secondary, which we have a route here to go to Worms, Oviedo, Sabot do a hold and then mco36 right and the environmentals are set for our return and then you can say you know any questions we're below maximum uh landing weight if we're not we're going to do an overweight landing qrh procedure and this is it guys this is our the end of our cockpit preparation